Welcome to a Legendarium special about Johan de Witt, a Dutch Prime Minister cannibalized by the voters. In this episode, we will learn about what could happen to you if you lost an election during the 17th century. Johan de Witt was born into an illustrious Dutch family on September 24, 1625. His father served as mayor of their hometown Dordrecht, and his background ensured success in whatever path young Johan chose. After studying mathematics, Johan wrote one of the first books on analytical geometry. The future looked bright for young Johan, and despite this early interest in mathematics, he chose to follow in his father's footsteps and enter politics. Like his father, Johan strongly opposed the House of Orange, a princely dynasty that once dominated the Dutch Republic. Leading the Republic's radical merchants, the handsome and charming Johan de Witt rose to become prime minister or grand pensionary for the Dutch Republic in 1653 at the age of 28. He came to power during the Dutch Golden Age, when Amsterdam served as the hub of world trade and the Dutch East India Company dominated the rich Asian spice routes. Once in office, De Witt used his math skills to handle the Republic's finances. In foreign policy, De Witt set England and France, the Republic's two worst enemies, against one another. Meanwhile, De Witt continued to oppose the Orange Dynasty and stopped the princely family from gaining any other offices in the Republic. Dutch voters approved and re-elected him three times, granting him 20 years in power. The struggle between England and France finally came to a head during the Anglo-Dutch War of 1665. At first, De Witt benefited from the war. The state of Holland even abolished the office of Stadtholder, so Willem III of Orange could not inherit his father's office. However, by 1672, the war turned against both the Dutch and Johann de Witt. King Louis XIV saw the Dutch as a rival for control of the seas and invaded the Dutch homeland. Since de Witt poured most state funds into the navy, he left the Dutch Republic itself dangerously unprotected. When the French army entered the Republic, hastily raised Dutch militias suffered terrible losses. In a desperate attempt to slow the French advance, De Witt ordered some of the dikes opened and the countryside flooded. This did slow the French advance, but at a terrible cost to Dutch farmland. On June 21, 1672, Johann walked home, his servant walking in front of him. Two strangers suddenly put out the street lights and attacked them. One stabbed De Witt in the neck and he fell, injuring his head. While he lay in the street, the men stabbed him two more times with knives. Though he survived, Johann de Witt remained bedridden until August. By the time he recovered, one of the young aristocrats who attacked him already did the gallows dance. Unfortunately, while Johann lay in his sickbed, a shady barber surgeon named Willem Tichelar told a court that Cornelius de Witt, Johann's brother, offered him 30,000 guilders to murder Willem III of Orange. The angry Dutch people called for Willem III of Orange to take power, for they thought he had the strength to protect their republic against the French. Happily obliging, Willem III of Orange arrested Johann de Witt's brother Cornelius and imprisoned him at The Hague. On August 4th, Johann de Witt left the office he held for 20 years, sensing that public opinion hopelessly turned against him. During the week that followed, the court failed to convict his brother Cornelius for criminal conspiracy, even though rumors swirled that the De Witt brothers plotted an escape. Posters and pamphlets circulated throughout The Hague, calling for the murder of the De Witt brothers, who brought so much misfortune to the Netherlands. On August 20th, Johann received a messenger asking him to visit his brother Cornelius at the Hague prison. His housemates found it odd that his brother sent a mere maid to deliver this important message, but Johann still went. Little did he know that an organized mob waited for him with sledgehammers, knives, and swords in hand. The baying mob broke into the prison after Johann entered and seized both DeWitt brothers. 
rioters stabbed Cornelia several times and injured Johann with a spike in the head before shooting him in the back of the skull with a pistol. With butcher knives, the rioters finished off Cornelius. The mob then completely undressed the two corpses and hung them upside down from the seesaw on the growing zood. Yet this did not appease the angry mob. People walking by stopped to beat the bodies with sticks. They started cutting off anything they could. Toes, fingers, thumbs, ears, noses, lips, and hands. Some opened the bellies and tore the intestines from the dead brothers and fed them to the dogs. Some people even began eating the DeWitt brothers. Some of the rioters went about town selling small slices of the corpses of Johann and Cornelius DeWitt at ten sous apiece. Some even sold pieces of the brothers' clothes to bystanders at auction, while others proudly displayed pieces of their bodies in pubs. Some of Johann and Cornelius's body parts still survive today and are preserved in the Historical Museum of The Hague, where the prison gates once stood. A few DeWitt supporters seemingly put together a box of relics, containing a finger and tongue belonging to Johann DeWitt, alongside a poem and a few documents. One shopkeeper even kept the brothers' hearts, preserved in jars of turpentine oil, on display. The Dutch Republic's new ruler, William III of Orange, did nothing to prosecute the ringleaders of the mob, probably because he organized it. Today, there are three statues of Johann de Witt in the Netherlands, all built in the 20th century, a tribute to the man eaten by his own people. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.